Hello and welcome to module 2 of the CCNA video online training. This module as you can see will cover networking protocols and network devices. Oops. So the objectives of this module um, will be to discuss and understand the role of network protocols. Uh, we will list key standards organizations and the protocols for which they are responsible. Um, we'll also cover and understand the functions of the OSI 7 layer reference model of networking. This is, this is fundamental that this will be an exam uh, and it's, it's, it's absolutely paramount that you, that you understand it. Um, so we'll go over that. We'll also describe the functions of common network device types. We also need to understand the, the role of packets and frames in transferring data across a network. So let's start this off. So in order to understand how networks function, you, you need to know some of the rules which are used by network devices in communicating with each other. Uh, these rules are usually referred to as network protocols. You'll need to distinguish between functions of different devices within a network. So, we start by taking a brief look at some of the more important network protocols and the authorities responsible developing and maintaining them. Um, in this video course, we shall be concerned mainly with the TCP IP protocol suite managed by the Internet Society ISOC. Uh, we'll also look at the LAN standards developed by the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineering, or IEEE and also the Open Systems Interconnection, or in other words, OSI, protocols, published by the International Organization for Standardization. Uh, we will cover more about IEE LAN standards in Module 3, um, but in this module we shall concentrate on the OSI 7-layer model of networking. These are a set of protocols defining seven key functions required for two systems to communicate with each other across a network. This model is particularly useful in helping us to understand the role of a device within a network in terms of the OSI layer function which it carries out. So let's look at network protocols. In order for two or more systems to communicate across a network, they need a common language and a set of rules governing the conversation between them. Together, the language and the rules are known as a network protocol. Ideally, there would be a single language and a single set of rules allowing all computer systems to interoperate. But this is rarely the case. In part, this is due to the fact that as new technologies emerge, obviously new protocols must be created. So there needs to be standards. In order for protocols to be useful and widely accepted, they must be clearly defined, as well as being maintained to take account for emer of emerging technologies. These are the responsibilities of the various standards authorities. So the International Organization for Standardization has become an umbrella authority for technology standards. ISO has published its own set of protocols known as the OSI or Open Systems Interconnection. These protocols are mainly used for mail and directory services applications. However, ISO has developed a seven layer model of networking functionality, the OSI reference model, which we will look at in some detail in this module. The IEEE, or Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers, is a professional or organization that formulates and promotes standards for computing and electrical engineering. It is responsible for many LAN standards. The Internet Society, or the ISOC, these, these, this um, organization was set up in 1992 with overall responsibility for internet technologies and applications. So what I'm now going to do is move on to the seven layer OSI model and we'll go through each layer 
uh, with, with definitions of, of what they do, what they represent, so on and so forth. Right, so the, the, what is the OSI level the model? Sorry, the OSI reference model is the ISO's abstract model of the networking functionality required for two systems to communicate over a network. It breaks down the network functions into seven layers. Being modular, the model can cope with the addition of new protocols as new technologies emerge. It also has the advantage of being vendor independent. The function of each of the layers is described as follows. So first of all, we have layer seven, which is the application layer. So in here, uh, the, the basic function of the application layer is for uh, protocols for specific network, network applications such as email, file transfer and web access. Then we have the presentation layer. These handle protocols for handling data represented in different formats on different systems and encrypting and decrypting data. Followed by the session layer. The session layer handles protocols controlling the establishment and termination of sessions between applications, as well as the orderly exchange of data between the applications during the session. Transport layer. This, pro, this, this layer is responsible for end-to-end -end connection across a network. Network layer. Uh, this is responsible for specifying network-wide addressing schemes and how data is routed across a network consisting of more than one physical segment. Moving on to data link. Uh, this relates to protocols concerned with data transfer between two or more directly connected systems. And finally, physical layer. This specifies the physical characteristics of transmission channels and the signaling standards used to transfer data across them. Now, obviously, I've, I've gone through, that was a, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, of the seven-layer reference model. We'll go through each one of them in, in, in more detail uh, shortly. So uh, what I just wanted to, to explain was about peer layers, and this is a diagram. So um, each layer provides a service to the layer immediately above it and it also requests a service from the layer immediately below. Each layer also has a virtual conversion with its corresponding peer layer on the remote system. As you can see on the screen, the rules governing this conversation are known as a protocol. So the data sent by an application needs to be transformed from the format used by the application into a form capable of being transmitted across a physical link. Each layer beneath the application layer performs a step in the task of transforming the data. When the data is received by the destination system, each layer successively undoes the transformations so that the destination application receives the data in a format that it can understand. Effectively, for, from the sending application, the, the changes are made through the layers and then at the other side, so to speak, uh, the, the reverse is done, so, so it goes back to the to, to the way that the originating application sent the information. So let me just discuss um, w what um, the, the data is called, the, the data in between layers. So that, that, that's what's known as protocol data units, and that's the diagram explaining how it works. So pro what are protocol data units? Uh, they, the data exchange between peer lay layers is divided into discrete units called protocol data units. So each layer constructs its own PDU to prepare the data for transmission across the network. The PDU comprises a header section and a da the data payload shown in the screen. So for example here, what you see there is each layer sends information to its peer layer on the destination system by adding a header to the PDU that it re receives from the layer above. And, and subsequently the destination peer reads this header sorry, 
before stripping it off and delivering the data to the layer above. In this way, each layer sees the PDU generated by its peer layer on the remote system. And at the bottom, you'll see um, uh, layer N header. Uh, layer N adds a header to the PDU that it receives from the layer N plus one. The header and data payload together become, become the PDU for layer N. The layer N PDU will become the payload, data payload for the layer below. The header section contains important control information that will be used by the receiving peer layer. This information will usually include address fields which tell the peer layer where to deliver the data, either to a particular higher layer or to another system entirely. Some layer 2 implementations such as Ethernet will also add a trailer containing a checksum which is used to verify the integrity of the data. Now please note the physical layer or layer 1 is the only layer at which data in the form of electromagnetic sorry electromagnetic bits actually travels between directly connected system. So it does not add headers or trailers but it converts bits in the data link PDU into the appropriate electromagnetic signals for the physical channel being used. So the names of the PDUs for each layer can vary accordingly to the protocol being used. Some of the more common uh, names are given in the next slide. Here we go. So we've got physical electromagnetic magnetic bit. Data link, which is frame, network, which is packet, transport, which is segment for TCP IP, or sorry, for TCP, and datagram for UDP, and then the, in the higher layers you've got uh, session PDU, presentation, and application. Uh, note that these are these, you must remember these for the exam. Uh, know, you know, what layer is a frame uh, used or a packet, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so moving on to data flow okay what you see there so uh, each receiving peer layer will strip off and read the header and trailer if any added by the sending peer it will then deliver the data payload to the appropriate higher layer protocol or in the case of layer 3 on a router for example forward the data to another destination this technique allows each layer logically to exchange PDUs with its corresponding peer layers on remote systems while the actual data moves vertically along the protocol stack as shown on the screen. So now let's move on to multiple protocol stacks. So far we have treated each layer as comprising of a single protocol. However, most systems can support a number of protocols at each layer. This is particularly true of the application layer. A lower layer may need to accept PDUs from multiple protocols at the layer above. This process is sometimes known as multiplexing. The layer will also have to deliver incoming data payloads to the appropriate higher layer protocols. As shown on the screen, a process sometimes known as demultiplexing. This is made possible by the inclusion in the PDU's header of a number of uniquely identifying high layer protocol. The protocol address is known as a service access point. In the TCPIP protocol suite, the term SAP is not used. Protocols at the network and transport layers are distinguished by a protocol number. And protocols at the application layer are distinguished by port number. So now um, I'm going to move on to talking about each layer in individually, starting with layer 1, which is the physical layer. Okay. So the physical layer is responsible for converting each frame into a sequence of bits encoded in an electromagnetic signal. 
which can be transmitted across the communications channel. This channel can be physical cabling such as copper wire or fiber optic cable or it can be a radio signal as in the case of wireless communications. So what you need to take into consideration is uh, as you can see the transmission medium so uh, in other words the physical characteristics such as the material the construction and the electrical or optical properties of a cable and then we, we've got the run length so the maximum length of cable allowed without the need to boost the signal using repeaters i.e. cat5 would be 100 meters uh, interfaces and connectors so the function and construction of network interfaces and connectors and finally you've got signaling method so how bits 1 and 0 are represented the carrier frequencies and how they are modulated and special signals used to indicate the start and end of transmission data link layer the data link layer is responsible for the transmission of data from one system to another directly connected to it. The data link layer accepts packets from the network layer above and encapsulates them into frames which are converted into electromagnetic bits by the physical layer below. The reverse process occurs for inbound data. So an example of an Ethernet frame is shown here. So this is an Ethernet 2 frame. You'll encounter other types of Ethernet frames later on in Module 3. Um, a frame usually has three parts. So you've got, um, excuse me, you've got a header, which is uh, there on the right, excuse me. Uh, so the header contains control information such as the source and destination MAC address. It also contains the, uh, the identifier of the protocol of the encapsulated packet. So then you've got the actual data uh, and that, that consists of the encapsulated packet and then the trailer. This usually contains a checksum used to verify the integrity of the data. The, the preamble here uh, is not part of the frame proper. It is used to, sig to signal the beginning of the frame and to ensure that the sender and receiver are synchronized. The source and destination MAC addresses are used to identify the sending and receiving network adapters, as explained in the next section. So now I'm going to talk about MAC addresses or medium access control. Uh, I'll put the table up on the screen uh, just giving you some bullet points about MAC addresses. So, um, so the, the data link layer is responsible for sending frames from one network device to another directly attached network device. If the two devices are connected via a point to point link, uh, th there's no problem in determining how to send the frame to its destination obviously. However, in LANs, where many network interfaces are directly connected to each other, um, it is necessary to have addresses that uniquely identify the sending and receiving network interfaces. So when you've got devices in a LAN that are connected to switches, this is where MAC addresses come into play. Each LAN network adapter has a unique built-in address called the MAC address. LAN frames carry the source and destination MAC addresses in their headers. This arrangement allows a frame to be picked up only by the network interface whose MAC address is specified in the frame header. This type of MAC address, which specifies a single target as its destination, is called a unicast MAC address. It is also possible for a MAC address to specify multiple targets usually devices of a similar type, for example, or switches. This type of MAC address is called a multicast MAC address. Finally, um, it's possible for a MAC address to specify all connected targets. 
This type of MAC address is called a broadcast MAC address. Um, just to note that on the three types of MAC addresses, um, the, the the distinction between unicast, multicast, and broadcast addressing also applies to other types of addresses such as IPv4, which we will cover in Module 6, um, which is about IP addressing. So, um, the MAC address of a network interface is known as a, its MAC 48 address and it's a 48-bit binary number burnt into the adapter's hardware by the manufacturer effectively. It's sometimes known as the burnt-in address, BIA. The first 24 bits known as the Organizationally Unique, unique Identifier or OUI which you, you will come across often um, identify the manufacturer. The remaining 24 bits known as the NIC specific identifier or NIC are uniquely to each interface produced with that manufacturer's ID. So the format of the MAC48 address is shown on the screen. The first octet of the OUI has two bits with special meanings. If the least significant bit is set to zero, the address is a unicast address. If it is set to one, the address is a multicast address. As you have seen earlier, a burnt-in MAC address is globally unique. However, it is possible to create a locally defined MAC address to use in place of the burnt-in address. The second bit of the first octet is used to distinguish between these different types of addresses. If it is set to zero, the address is globally unique. If it is set to one, the address is locally administered. Although MAC addresses are hardwired into network adapters, most operating systems allow you to override the burnt-in address by setting another address for the adapter to use. This locally administered address does not overwrite the burnt-in address, but it is used instead of, of it as the source address of the adapter. You should not normally do this, as you will be responsible for ensuring that any addresses you set are unique. When displayed by configuration software, the MAC address is usually re represented as a 12-digit hexadecimal number separated into blocks by dashes, dots or colons. The actual representation will, will vary according to the operating system used. For example, the MAC address 000458 um, sorry, 0008E, th this one here, 00080845858F2 would be displayed like that on Windows with the dashes. And on the Cisco router, it would have dots, and so on and so forth. Just delete those so you can see that. Oops. The dots and dashes and colons have no numerical significance. They are there just to make the number easier to read. However, when entering MAC addresses, you'll need to use the separators supported by the operating system that you are using. So on Windows Server, uh, it will often ask want to, to put the dashes in there. The broadcast MAC address is used to send a frame to all directly connected LAN hosts. It has all 48 bits set to 1, FFFF. This one. Um, so here uh, on the screen, You've got three examples of unicast, multicast, and broadcast, and how they're represented by different network operating systems, as explained. So, um, the EUI, or Extended User Interface Address. With just 24 bits, a manufacturer can create under 17 million interfaces with distinct addresses. This is sufficient for many manufacturers nowadays. One way around this problem has been to assign multiple OUIs to some of the larger manufacturers. A better solution is to increase the address space available for network interfaces. 
there is a new standard for interface addresses using 64 bits and this is called the Extended User Interface EUI or EUI64. The first three octics will, will still define the manufacturer's OUI with the remaining five octets used to identify the network interface as you can see on the screen. This increases the number of unique addresses available to each manufacturer over to a trillion. The role of the first and second bits on the first octet remains the same. MAC addresses or EUI addresses by themselves cannot be used to route data to remote networks. This is the job of the network layer. So we'll move on now to uh, explain about data link sublayers. The, the sublayer, the data link sublayer is divided into two sublayers. We've got LLC, logical link control. This accepts packets from and delivers packets to the network layer above. It allows more than one network layer protocol to be used. Then we have the MAC sublayer, media, medium access control, and this is responsible for generating frames appropriate to the particular network interface in use. It allows more than one network adapter to be supported. The LLC and MAC sublayers allow multiple network layer protocols to access multiple network interfaces on a single system. LAN standards for the LLC and MAC sublayers of the data link layer are specified by the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers, or IEEE, who are a professional organisation that formulates and promotes standards for computing and electrical engineering. Some of the most important standards are shown in the following slide. Each of these standards can have variants indicated by letters, such as IEEE 802.11.G and IEEE 802.11.N, wireless LAN standards that you will learn more about in Module 3. These standards have also been adopted by ISO, which refers to them as ISO 8802-2, ISO 8802-3 and so on. However, the IEEE notation is the, one of the most widely used. So, moving on to the network layer. As we've already mentioned, MAC addresses are not used to route data to remote networks. There are two main reasons for this. Firstly, only LAN interfaces have burnt in MAC addresses. This means that MAC addresses are not suitable for addressing frames to a serial interface, for example. Second, there is the more general problem of how to forward data to a remote destination. In this slide, for example, when router A receives data from PC1 with, with a destination of PC2 over here, it must decide how to forward that data via router B or router C. It makes its decision based on the contents of its routing table, which tells it how to forward data bound for remote destinations. In this case, data is for PC2. And in this particular case, it's forwarded to router B this way. If router A needed to know a route to every destination in the world, its routing table would be unmanageably large and almost impossible to maintain. This is why a single, simple address like MAC address is not appropriate for routing to remote networks. Layer 3 protocols like the Internet Protocol IP use addresses consisting of at least two parts, a network portion and a portion identifying the host within a network. In this way, routers only need to know the addresses of other networks rather than the addresses of each individual destination, making the routing tables much smaller, obviously, and easier to update. For this to work, all network destinations sharing the same network address should be connected to the same physical network. 
On the slide now, what I've put up now, you can see how packets and frames are both used in sending data from one system to another. PCA has a packet to send to PCB. As PCB is on another network, PCA sends the packet to its local router, which is there. Router X. It does this by encapsulating the packet for PCB inside an Ethernet frame, which it sends to router X. After consulting its routing table, router X decides that it needs to forward the packet to router Y. It is connected to router Y by a serial link, which uses PPP protocol, or point-to-point -point protocol, frame type. So it encapsulates the packet for PCB inside a PPP frame which it sends to router Y. Finally, router Y sends the packet directly to PCB, encapsulated inside an Ethernet frame addressed to PCB. The packet transverses the, traverses the network while the frame carry the packet from one device to another, directly connected device. Transport layer. The transport layer provides end-to-end -end communication by hiding the underlying network from the higher layers and allowing endpoints to establish direct connections to each other. The transport layer generally provides at least two services, a reliable connection-oriented service and an unreliable connectionless service. In the TCP IP protocol suite, these are TCP and UDP. So transmission control protocol and user datagram protocol, respectively. A connection oriented service or a TCP service requires a connection to be established between endpoints, such as applications running on PCs, before they can exchange data. A connection less service or UDP sends data without any prior negotiation. The PDU for TCP is known as a segment and the PDU for a UDP is known as a datagram. You will learn more about TCP and UDP in module 5. Session layer. The session layer is responsible for managing sessions between communicating applications on different systems. It allows one application to place a call to another application, exchange data with it and then terminate the call when it has finished exchanging data. So effectively the session layout consists of three different uh, functions. Session establishment, so this effectively sets up a two-way session between two applications. The, then we have session management, uh, it, it establishes synchronization points which allows a session to be rolled back partially in the event of an error, avoiding the need to restart the entire session. And then we've got session termination, ending the session gracefully when both sides agree to stop. Presentation layer. The presentation layer is responsible for handling data represented in different formats on different systems. For example, a PC may store the letter A in its memory as the binary equivalent of a decimal number 65 using the ASCII or Unicode systems for representing data. An IBM computer may use a different way of encoding the letter A, for example 193, using extended binary coded decimal interchange code or EBCDIC. If the PC needs to send data to the IBM computer, the presentation layer, for example, can handle the translation between the two coding systems. The presentation layer can also handle the encryption and decryption of data. However, encryption and decryption can also be handled at other layers, including the physical layer, which can incorporate specialised cryptographic hardware. And finally, the application layer. The application layer defines protocols for networking applications, such as email, file transfer and web access. In this video training course, we shall be looking at the number of application protocols for the TCP IP protocol suite. Cisco has developed a hierarchical model of networking as shown on the slide. 
to simplify the task of network design. It consists of three layers, each with a specific function in delivering network services. Unfortunately, each layer has two possible names. However, it is worth being familiar with this model as it is sometimes referred to in Cisco communication. The access layer excuse me, describes a connection of, of users to the network. The switches and hubs are often used at this layer. It is also called the desktop layer. The main function of the distribution layer in the middle is to provide routing, filtering, security and access to the WAN. It also segments the network into different broadcast domains to minimize traffic and translates between different LAN media types such as token ring and ethernet. Routers are typically used at this layer. It provides the connection between the access layer and the core layer. It is also known or called the workgroup layer. The core layer at the top provides high speed switching of network traffic with access to global resources such as the internet. High specification switches are typically used at this layer. This is also called the backbone layer. The OSI 7 layer reference model provides a useful framework for understanding the roles of the different types of devices found in a network. Each of these devices typically operates at a particular OSI layer. Some of the more common network devices are described in the following sections. Layer 1 repeaters. Devices which function at layer 1 either implement the physical infrastructure of the network, like hubs, or act on the physical EM signal, like repeaters. Repeaters are devices that operate at the physical layer. They allow the normal, maximum run lengths of cables to be exceeded by boosting the signal quality. The signal quality deteriorates as the length of cable increases. So as, as the, 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 the segment of cable increases, you, you suffer attenuation, interference, noise and distortion. Attenuation means uh, basically as the signal propagates down a cable, it weakens. Uh, this is true both of wire and fibre optic cable, but is considerably less pronounced in fibre optic cables. Wire t cables tend to act as transmitting aerials, radiating away from some of the en energy of the signal. Um, interference you have there. Wire cables can also act as receiving aerials, picking up stray electromagnetic radiation from other sources, for example electric motors and fluorescent lighting circuitry, or from neighbouring communication cabling, when interference is when the interference is referred to as crosstalk. Sorry about that. So uh, if you have LAN cabling in your office, in the ceiling or in the walls, uh, Sometimes, if it's not done properly or you're not using shielded Cat5 and, and the cables are running close to power cables or fluorescent lights in the roof, it can cause problems and uh, quite, quite strange ones at that. Um, we've got noise or thermal noise. Cables can also generate random electronical signals due to their thermal energy. And then finally, you've got distortion. If the properties of the cable are not ideally matched to the signal, the shape of the signal can change as it propagates through the cable. As I said, repeaters act at the physical layer to restore the magnitude and the quality of the electromagnetic signals. They perform no intelligent processing. They simply restore the shape of the signal to counteract the effects of, of the above, of, of the attenuation, interference, noise and distortion and uh, they basically boost the strength of the signal to overcome uh, the above. When used to boost signals in, in serial or parallel cables, repeaters are sometimes referred to as line drivers. Moving on to layer 1 hubs. We have already encountered hubs as devices that implement the connection between end devices and a LAN. Hubs are also devices that operate at the physical layer. Small, simple hubs, uh, gen typically with four ports, that do not have an independent power supply are known as passive hubs. 
they will simply take a signal that arrives in one port and replicate it to all other ports without performing any other processing. Hubs with their own power supplies, known as active hubs, will also function as repeaters, regenerating the signal before forwarding to other ports. Layer 2. So devices that function at layer 2 carry out processing of frames based on the contents of the frame header and trailer. They include bridges, switches and wireless access points. So layer 2 bridges uh, physically connect separate network segments together to form a single LAN. However, they differ from simple hubs in that they do not forward all of the frames from one network segment to the other. They examine the header of each frame to determine the source MAC address. In this way, they build a table in memory, in the, in the memory of the, of, the, of the bridge, of which MAC addresses belong to each segment. They use this information to determine whether to forward the frame according to the rules on the screen at the moment. These features mean that bridges reduce unnecessary traffic on LAN segments. Just take a look at the screen, um, pause it if you, if you need to before moving on. For frames with multicast destination addresses, the default, default behaviour is to flood the frames as if they were broadcast frames. This is not very efficient. A broadcast frame really does need to be forwarded to all destinations on the LAN. However, a multicast frame only needs to be sent to the parts of the network containing devices belonging to the multicast target group. There are techniques which allow more intelligent forwarding of multicast frames, but they are beyond the scope of this, this video course. As far as the CCNA exam is concerned, you should assume that multicast frames are flooded like broadcast frames. Let's move on to transparent bridging. As you can see on the screen, um, what you see here is an example of bridging in, at work. When the bridge is first powered, it has no entries in its table of MAC addresses, which are kept in RAM. Some bridges may allow table entries to be added manually. However, the usual case is for the table to be populated dynamically. When PCA first sends a frame to PCB, the bridge has no entry for the MAC address of PCB, so it forwards a frame to the right-hand LAN segment. However, it immediately adds PCA's MAC address to its MAC address table, specifying that it is on the left-hand side of the LAN segment. It knows this because the frame of PCA contained the MAC address of PCA as the source MAC address. When PCB replies to PCA, the bridge does not forward the frame to the right-hand LAN segment because it now knows that PCA is not on that segment. It also adds the MAC address of PCB to its MAC address table. In future, traffic between PCs A and B will not be forwarded to the right-hand segment, thus reducing traffic on that segment. So this process is, is basically known as transparent bridging because the end stations are unaware of the bridge and take no active part in the process. As far as they're concerned, they are connected to a single LAN segment. Bridging loops. The simple bridging mechanism we have just described would not work where there are multiple paths between network segments, as you can see on the screen. If PCX, for example, sends a frame to PCY, both bridges receive the frame and mark PCX as being on segment 1. If bridge A is the first to forward the frame to segment 2, bridge B will forward the frame back onto segment 1 and mark host X as being on segment 2. This would result in frames looping around the network. A simple remedy would be to construct the network with no loops at all, obviously. However, in this case, any bridge becomes a single point of failure. If resilience is required, physical loops are useful. And this is where STP, or Spanning Tree Protocol, which we will cover, um, will come in. So, um, 
in order to support resilience and avoid the problems just described of loops, the bridges need to communicate with each other in order to avoid setting up bridging loops. They can do this by using a protocol called spanning tree protocol, specified by the eight uh, sorry specified by the IEEE 802.1D standard. This allows bridges to block frames on some of their interfaces to create a loop-free network. So if a bridge fails, the remaining bridges can reactivate some of their interfaces to reconnect network segments. We'll cover spanning tree in more detail in module 14 of this video training course. Switches. A switch can be considered as a hub with bridging functionality. An ordinary hub connects every network station attached to its ports into one network segment. All stations share the same segment and contend for access to it. Only one station can transmit to the hub at any given time, during which other stations are blocked from transmission, transmitting data. It can happen that two stations attempt to send data at the same time, or very nearly at the same time. This results in a collision, which requires both stations to retransmit the data at a later time. Collisions are covered more in Module 3. A switch, rather like a bridge, learns the MAC addresses of the stations attached to each of its ports. In this respect, it behaves as a multi-port bridge. If one station needs to send a frame to another attached station, the switch sets up a temporary link between the two ports. This link operates at full bandwidth, typically 100 megabits per second. The switch can also allow other pairs of ports to communicate simultaneously. So as you can see on the diagram, the switch is providing three temporary simultaneous links at full bandwidth. Switches, like bridges, operate at the data link layer. Wireless access points forward frames between end stations in a WLAN. As such, they operate at the data link layer. When an access point receives a frame from a WLAN station, it broadcasts it on the wireless channel used by the WLAN. However, it is unlike a simple hub a physical layer device which just forwards signals in that it also carries out some processing based on the data in the frame such as MAC address filtering and authentication which are used to implement security. Moving on to layer 3 devices that function at layer 3 carry out processing of packets based on the contents of the packet header they include routers and what's known as B routers Routers, so you've already seen how routers forward packets to remote network destinations based on the contents of their routing tables. The contents of the routing tables can be created by an administrator, but more often they are learned dynamically by routers exchanging information about the networks they know with neighbouring routers. This exchange of routing information is governed by a routing protocol, and we'll cover more about routing protocols in Module 9. B routers, sometimes written as Bruter, is a device that performs the functions of both a bridge and a router. It can be used to forward frames or packets between two network segments. As you can see, two LANs which need to be connected on the screen. A router can be used to forward packets between the two LANs, however some applications may need to exchange frames directly. Because they use a non-routable protocol, such as NetBuoy, uh, which uses uh, only frames. In this case, a B router will handle both kinds of traffic. Nowadays, you probably will only encounter non-routable protocols in legacy environments. They suffer from the fact that broadcast frames are always forwarded, increasing network traffic. By default, routers never forward broadcast packets. B routers operate at the data link and network layers. Multi-layer switches 
can combine data link and network layer functionality, providing local switching and remote routing. The reason they are called switches rather than routers is that their hardware is more like that of a switch. Switches use Application Specific Integrated Circuits, or ASICS, whereas routers are based on microprocessors similar to those in PCs. ASICs are faster though not as versatile as microprocessors, so an MLS multi-layer switch will generally have less routing functionality than a dedicated router. This disadvantage is, is often outweighed by its speed and also the convergence, sorry, the convenience of having the switch and routing functionality in the same device. Multi-layer switches may also manage traffic based on the headers of higher layer protocols. Just to note, for this course, we shall only consider layer two switches and layer three routers. Any reference to switching should be understood as meaning layer two switching. Layers four to seven, uh, devices allowing different protocols to interoperate at layer four to seven are known as gateways. Gateways allow systems to communicate with each other when using programs that are similar in function, but which are based on different underlying protocols, and so cannot communicate directly. A gateway contains software running each protocol, as well as software responsible for translating data from the format of one protocol to that of the other. A typical example is shown on the screen. Two companies merge. One uses an email system based on simple mail transfer protocol, or SMTP, and the other uses X.400 for its email system. Both sim systems perform similar functions but use different formats for email addresses, as well as for the email messages themselves. An SMTP to X.400 gateway will allow users in both organisations to exchange email messages with each other, while still using their existing systems. Just to note, in OSI documentation, the term gateway has the meaning just, just provided. However, when discussing routing in an IP environment, gateway means the IP address of the interface of a local router. So what, what I've put on the screen now um, are the relationships between devices and OSI layers. So this concludes module two. Uh, just to re recap, what, what this, this module covered. Um, after listening to, to the, and, and looking at the slides, you should be able to understand the role of network protocols, um, list key standard organizations and the protocols for which they are responsible, understand the function of the OSI seven layer reference model of networking, describe the functions of common network device types, and understand the roles of packets and frames in transferring data across a network. Thanks for listening and uh, please uh, refer back for module three. Thanks.